Good morning and welcome to Eden United Methodist Church Service, live and live stream from beautiful downtown Eden, New York on a nice sunshiny morning. I'm Jim Monroe and I've got a couple announcements this morning. On Monday morning uh, it's, uh, at uh, 9.30 a.m. is the uh, Monday morning Bible study class and I'm going to back up a little bit. And this afternoon at 6 o'clock is a small group with... Uh, okay. That's right, I didn't see a note on that. Don't Starting worry about at 16th. it. The, the, that okay. will start on the 16th. Forget on April. Sunday. Tuesday at 7 p.m. is a trusting meeting. And then Wednesday at 12 noon is a prayer meeting with Pastor Kate. And on Wednesday, that's a prayer meeting with Pastor Kate, is a small group with Carol Brody at 6.30 p.m. Thursday at 2 p.m. is a small group with Beth. And that's also on Zoom if, uh, if you don't want to come into this uh, church service or church. And at 6.30 p.m. is holy worship. It, it, the choir practice, okay, it's, it's 6.30, excuse me. And at 6 o'clock, there's a misprint there. It's worship service for uh, Holy Thursday. And on Friday, for the Good Friday service, at 6 o'clock also, 6 o'clock p.m. So make sure you, you cross out 7 there and put 6. Our, our services for Holy Week this year are going to be on Thursday and Friday at 6 o'clock. So no choir practice at 6.30. Uh, the final fruit, yeah, fruit sale. <laughs> final fruit soup. Excuse me. Sale April sixteenth at seven dollars a quart. All must go. And we've got a, a anniversary. We're celebrating for a happy sixtieth anniversary for uh, Jim and uh, yeah, and Gloria. Excuse me. <laughs> wow, today is a tough day. <laughs> And it was on March 30th they celebrated that. We're having an Easter egg hunt on Sunday, April 19th at 10 a.m. We need candy. Wrapped the, candy. Bring some candy. Uh, I don't know when we're putting the Easter eggs together. Any idea? Probably Saturday. <laughs> we're, we're organized. <laughs> Just keep going. Just bring candy before the Easter egg hunt. We'll and United Methodist around. Men's Dinner is Wednesday, April 19th at 6.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And the service is, again, like I said, uh, Monday, Thursday is at 6 p.m. and Good Friday is at 6 p.m. And the Easter Sunday hunk, hunt is at, uh, oh, morning service is 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Egg hunt at 10 a.m. I better quit while I'm ahead. Well... <laughs> I'm struggling the today. Next thing, the next thing that you have to do, and I'm, I'm a little concerned about this, can you read Matthew chapter 21, yes, verses 1 through 11? Because yes, it's Palm Sunday, and so it worships a little bit in, in a different order. And Jim, we love you anyway. Thank you. I do happen to have it right here. Our opening reading would be Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And our opening hymn is All Glory, Lord, and Honor. It's number 280 in the Maroon Book. Please stand up. If you think you can handle uh, singing and walking around behind the kids as they pass, give it a shot. <laughs> Oh, glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. Thou art the King. 
King of Israel, thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's name comest, the King and Blessed One. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring, the company of angels are praising the on high, and we with all creation in chorus make reply. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. The people of the Hebrews with pause before thee went. Our prayer and praise and anthems before thee we present. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. To thee before thy passion they sang their hymns of praise. To thee now high exalted our melody we raise. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. Thou didst accept their praises, accept the prayers we bring, who in all good delightest, thou good and gracious King. Glory, Lord, and honor to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children may sweet hosannas ring. be seated. Please join me in the opening prayer. Almighty and ever-loving God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Work on earth has been suspended 
as the king comes through the gate. Happy faces lie your hallways, those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken hearts that he has mended, those from prison he has freed. Little children. Will the children come forward? Hey, can somebody go grab a donkey? Okay, none of you laughed. Like that that was not loud. Did you do you think they laughed? I don't think they laughed. <laughs> All right, so we have we have this donkey right here that Spencer's holding, and uh, um, it, when we started with Spencer's donkey, it kind of looked like Grogu. Anybody know who Grogu is? You would have said the same thing too, because the way he put the ears on is they stuck right out like this, doesn't that? That that's that's yeah, okay. They don't watch it, I can tell. So that's so this is the donkey that Spencer made in Sunday school. And why did we make a donkey? Why did we make a donkey? A donkey goes easy. Yes, it does. Good job. <laughs> Anybody know why we would have made a donkey in Sunday school? Any clue? Jesus rides a donkey. Oh, Jesus rides a donkey. Now, what we learned and when we read the story in Sunday school, and it was in the story we just read this morning, was what kind of donkey was it? Was it a big full-grown donkey? It was a little tiny baby donkey. Can you imagine a tall person on a little baby tiny donkey? Because they're, they're a lot smaller. I don't know if you've seen donkeys before, but they're, they're a lot smaller than that. Now, personally, I don't want to ride on one. They stink and they kick. But this was the story that we had. So what we did as we were walking around the church, you remember that part? Well, actually, Kathy said it at a pace that I'm pretty sure I got active minutes out of that. Thanks. Well, she was fast. Did anybody else think she was fast? Oh, it's just me. Okay, fine. <laughs> so as we were walking around, they were waving the palm fronds. That's what you guys were waving around, the palm fronds. And that is what the crowd did when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. 
Yes. Now, that's the first part of our story today. Now, the second part of our story is going to be where we talk about Jesus' passion. Does anyone know what that means? I love the egg on your face. I think you should show everybody. What, what does the passion mean? Do you remember? Should I ask for help? What does the passion mean? They're trying to whisper it at you for some reason. Can you get the crucifixion? Yeah, the crucifixion. So the second part of, of today is going to be where we talk about the crucifixion. But the first part, we celebrate that Jesus has entered into Jerusalem and everyone's excited. Now, I want to see if you can do a better job of making noise than they did at laughing at my really funny joke about donkeys. Okay? So you're the crowd that is gathered, even though you don't have your palm fronds. That's okay. We're, no, we're not running back to get them. You're the crowd that is gathered as Jesus enters Jerusalem. And you're saying, Hosanna to the king. Do you think you can say that like really loud with excitement? No? I'm going to give them a shot, and then I'm going to make the, uh, the adults join in, okay? You ready? There's a lot of them today. This is unusual. Like, okay, ready? Hosanna to the king. Hosanna to the king. You... All right, let's do that with a little bit more enthusiasm, okay? Ready? Because I don't think they heard you in the back. Did you hear them in the back, Karen? Did you? No, no, you didn't. That's right. Okay, ready? Hosanna to the king. Hosanna to the king. Much, much better. And this is what the crowds were saying all the way up until they didn't. Because at the next part of the story, we learn about Jesus' death. That's what comes next. So we're still in the excitement phase, so I want you guys to parade back to wherever your parents are or wherever you're sitting at the table. You ready? Oh, wait, I should pray. <laughs> Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for these children. We pray that as they continue to grow, we will help lead them in the way to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So this is another one of those long readings where we transition from the reading of the palms where the crowd is excited and, and shouting Hosanna to the king. Does anybody remember the next chant? Crucify. There you go. The next chant is crucify him. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to start, I'm going to ask you to join with me in prayer, and then I'm going to do what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks with these extra long readings and just go through the story of Jesus' passion. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious Lord, may our hearts and minds be open to what you would have us learn this day, that we would grow in your grace. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm having a warring battle, just so you know, in my head right now. And that's the one where I'm the pastor and I need to talk to you about Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday. And then there's the mother. Do you know why I would be the mother this week? So Andrew turned 10 in February, which means that all of Andrew's friends are mostly nine. And you all know what happened this week. This is one of those times where it's really difficult to figure out how to balance what I ought to say in light of what is going on in the world around us, because I think that it is absolutely imperative that we understand who our God is and what he has done for us so that we understand how we are to live rightly in this world where we're never sure what's going to happen next. It would be really easy to make a whole bunch of political statements for you, but that's not where I want us to focus. What I want us to focus on is the thing that I've talked about probably the most over the last couple of months, and that is the fact that every single one of us, every single one of us bears the image of God, though it is broken by sin. And when God calls us to live in right relationship with him, he also asks that we live in right relationship with the people in our world, the people around us. 
the fact that stuff happens like it does, like it did in Nashville this past week, because there are children here, I'm not going to be that clear. When those things happen, it is a reminder that our world is broken and that we are not in right relationship with God and that we are not in right relationship with one another. And so the story of the crucifixion, the story of Christ's death, is the story that tells us and invites us into a redeeming relationship with God, with ourselves, with the people around us. Did you get that? When we enter into that redeeming relationship with God, we are not only restored in terms of our relationship with God because our sin is forgiven, but our broken relationships within our lives have the, the capacity to be restored if we choose to. And then... That death also restores us so that we can be God's hands and feet at work in this world. This, this call to the Christian life, to the Christian faith, it is not a simple thing. Actually, when we have to live it in front of other people and show other people, yes, we truly do believe that that person over there, no matter who they are, what they sound like, what they look like, how much money they have, what kind of car they drive, what cell phone they use, has the very image of God in them though broken by sin. Do you think we can do that? To take that idea out into the world with us. When we see someone we just don't like, and I know that everybody has a moment where they see somebody who they just don't like. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'll be honest with you, I have moments where I see people I just don't like. And the first thought I think about them is what? Well, okay, I'll tell you what I think. I think, oh, what's wrong with them? Because usually they're doing something I don't like. Now, I didn't say that usually they were doing something that was ungodly and just absolutely wrong, because there are those moments, but I mean just being a normal, everyday human being. And it's just annoying me. I was driving down 62, and I wanted this car out of my way so bad. You know what they were doing? 45. Ooh, this is, this, oh, that's the speed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I wanted to get where I wanted to be faster than 45. And oh my goodness, they would dip down below 45. And then I'd have to remind myself of that time I mentioned it in a sermon and the fact that the sign on the side of the road says speed limit. But I was thinking all sorts of things in my head, I'll be honest. See, now that's an easy one, isn't it? That we can, we can pull that one out when we're driving because who else is watching? See, that's the key. How do we behave when no one else is watching us? Now, I had my kids in the car, so I was going to behave slightly more than I would if they weren't there because, well, I'm trying. But what do we do when the world is watching us? How do we behave? How many of you are on social media? Oh, be honest. It's more, be on, please, I just, uh, come on, it's going to, like, who isn't on social media should look like this. Like, nobody raising their hand, right? And then mostly, because I know there are people, and then there are people who are not on social media, I understand that. Now, how many times have you said to yourself before you click send, should I, should I do this? Nobody's ever done that? Come on now. Now I understand. See, I, I reserved uh, my social media posts to things I have no problem posting, pictures of my kids. And I've just stuck to that because it's way too easy to put things up on Facebook I'm going to regret later <laughs> or Twitter or Instagram because Facebook's the old one, I know. Okay, kids, what do you use? Snapchat? You don't want to tell me? Come on. You use more than Snapchat. I know you do. Parents find out what they're using. But how often do we think about what we say and how those words that we say will impact someone who is listening? Or how often do we think about the smile on our faces and how that, how that says something to someone else when we see them? See, most of the time we're thinking about, I need to get from A to B. I need to get to, get, to, get to the grocery store so I can pick up one, two, three items so that I can come back and make dinner, right? Those are the kinds of things we're thinking. We're not thinking about the person in front of us. 
But when Jesus goes to the cross, this is exactly what he's asking us to do. When Jesus himself chooses to go to the cross, because the part that we don't read on Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, is the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you know the story of the Garden of Gethsemane? I actually had the chance to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's pretty powerful when you think about what occurs there. But it's just after the Last Supper, and Jesus goes off to pray in the garden. He asks three of his disciples to sit awake and pray. What did they do? Okay, so you do know it. And then he came back and said, what's going on, guys? Come on, can't you stay awake? And then he went off to pray again, and and what did they do? And he did it a third time. Do you think this three has something? Is there some kind of thing being said there with the number of times this happens? Jesus says as he goes off to pray, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. We asked the kids in Sunday school what that cup meant. Take this cup from me, Jesus says. What does that cup mean? It's the cup of sorrow, of suffering, of sin that God willingly takes on, on our behalf. And the very next thing that happens is his arrest. His arrest that was brought about by his friend. And then there's a trial. There's a trial before the religious authorities where they judge Jesus because how could this man before them be the son of God? How could this man standing before them actually be the Messiah? They do actually ask him that question directly. I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. This is in 26. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Do you, can, can you imagine how the religious leaders felt when they heard that? Because Jesus is actually telling them off. Just wait. You want me to answer this question so that you can then go and crucify me, but what I'm going to tell you is that I know you're going to do those things, and the result of that is that I'm going to be up there with the Father looking down at you. I wonder if any of them had a moment in which they went, after Jesus' resurrection, which they went, oops, right? But when we have oopses like that, they're kind of like this profound, shameful moment. Most of the time for us as adults, we go, oh, that's more like it, isn't it? When we realize we've said something we ought not to say or done something we ought not to have done, belittled someone we ought not to have belittled, But that's not the way Jesus handles this, is it? Well, actually, it doesn't really matter at that point because he's taken off to Pilate. Now, this is verse 11 where the reading begins. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? I love how Jesus answers questions. I hate it when my children answer questions this way. You ready? You have said so. I asked a yes or no question. You know how infuriating that is? You ask the yes or no question and you get the, well, that's what you said. That's what you think, right? You can hear the teenage inflection, right? When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, I ha- he gave no answer. Then the f- Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. They're yelling, screaming, spitting, hurling insults, and he just, he's there. How many of us could tolerate that? Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd at that time. They had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus, Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? 
for he knew it was out of envy that they had handled, handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with the innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded. You ever seen that? Persuaded the crowd. Someone out there that gets the crowd to switch from what they're chanting to something else. I've seen that happen. It's a pretty powerful thing to watch as people don't even recognize that they've switched from one thing to another. And so now the crowd chants. You remember? Crucify him. Not quite yet, though. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask Barabbas to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. And the crowd said, Barabbas, or Barabbas. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Do it. We're going to get into character here. But they shouted all the louder. You don't want to say it, do you? But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, oh, this is even worse than crucify him. Do you know what the line is? His blood is on us and on our children. I'm not going to make you do that one. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. Then the, governor, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him, took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him. There, above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In all the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, all the church people. So that's how I want us to read when we see that. Because that's, the, that, that, that's what Matthew's trying to point out, and that's what Jesus was trying to point out. To all the people who have faithfully followed, or believe they have faithfully followed the rules, they're the ones standing over on the side. He saved himself! He saved others, they said, but, they can't, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from that cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God rescue him, if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults at him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, 
Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on the staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. They've mocked him. They've insulted him. And as he takes his last breath, instead of doing anything to stop what is happening before them, let's wait for the other guy to show up. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit at that moment, the curtain, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely, he was the son of God. What did the religious folks say? We're waiting for Elijah. We're waiting for a bigger sign. We need to see what comes next. Hey, if, if you really are the son of God, then you will show us in no uncertain terms. How many people has he healed? How many people has he brought back from the dead? How many people has Jesus spoken to directly? How many people has Jesus helped bring into the fullness of a relationship with God through him? And yet they want one more sign as he hangs dying on the cross, as he suffers, as he willingly takes the cup, and he takes that cup of suffering to the cross on our behalf, and as he hangs there dying, what do the religious folks do? Now, I know that most of us look at this and we say, we would never, ever do that. What did Peter do? He denied Jesus three times. What did Peter swear he would never do? Deny Jesus. Why did he deny Jesus? Because somebody wanted to put him in the crowd with Jesus, one of his followers, and he was more afraid of what would happen to him than what would happen if he said, yes, I know this man, I've seen what he's done, and he is capable of great things. He is the Son of God, the Most High. Did he say any of that? No. He acted like the teenager in all of us. I don't know him. I don't want to be associated with him. I've been watching a movie with, with my younger one. It's, a, it's another take on King Arthur. Do you know the story of King Arthur, the sword and the stone, where only the, the, the right person can come and release the, the, the sword from the stone? Yes, yeah, so we're watching this. And, and in this particular version, it talks about how Morgana's coming back because the world is just so messed up. Now, I noticed what year this movie was released in, and I just laughed because I was like, gosh, they didn't even wait to see what was coming next. What year was it? Come on, it's got to be easier than that. 2019. <laughs> I said, see, they didn't even know what was coming. And they were talking about how the world was a mess and nobody took care of one another. That was actually one of the reasons that they mentioned that she was coming back. She could feel the evil and, and the fact that people didn't care enough of, even about their friends, let alone a stranger who might be in need. And so this was the time that she could, she could come back and find power again because nobody cares about the other person. As Jesus hung on the cross, he not only cared for us, he loved each and every one of us deeply, so much so that he gave up his life on this earth to show us that our God, who loves us deeply, is willing to sacrifice himself so that we can be in right relationship with him, so that we can find forgiveness for sin, so that we can invite others to find forgiveness for their sin, so that we can be the hands and feet of God at work in this world, sharing the message of hope and not of death. Hope, not destruction. 
healing from brokenness. That is the message that our God gives us through Christ. Are we ready to take that on, that responsibility? Instead of standing off in the crowd watching what others do, are we willing to take responsibility for our life, our life in Christ, and live it as God has called us to? It's okay if the answer in your head is sometimes. Because that's usually what it is, isn't it? Sometimes. But the challenge that God has given us as the church is to do it as often as possible. Basically all the time. And God not only gives us this challenge, but he gives us a way to answer it. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us that life of prayer. He gives us all sorts of gifts to serve him and to share with others what it means to be loved and forgiven, what it means to be healed and made whole so that we don't have people walking around this world who think that their life has no value and that the lives of the people that they kill have no value either. Imagine if we had the potential as the hands and feet and words of God to make sure that no one felt alone. That's the message we've been given. That no one felt of no worth. Because that's the message God has given us the answer to those things. But it takes living out the life of faith before the world that is watching, that wants us to fight, that wants us to tear one another apart, that wants to see us be just like them. But we have Jesus. So we shouldn't be. So what are we going to do after hearing about one more of these violent inexcusable experiences in this world. Are we going to pray? I hope so, actually. But is it going to change the way we look at other human beings so that we ensure that no one, no one, no one believes they are of no value? Because what our God has taught us through the cross is that every single person who has breath has value. And he loves them. And he wants them to know that they are loved. And he asks us as his church to help them know that they are loved. What would it look like if your life changed so much that someone noticed that difference? Honestly, I'd really like it if every single person here showed up if you're not working on Wednesday at 12 o'clock as we gathered together in prayer because part of that prayer, that time of prayer that we're doing is to seek God's direction in difficult conversations. My hope is that it'll bring us to a place where we can actually behave like the people God has called us to. That we can actually be those folks, those hands and feet, those words of God, not only out in the world but with each other when we disagree. Because that's how God has asked us to live. I told my, my friend from high school, she's my best friend from high school, I told her the other day on the phone, I said, sometimes I use you as an example in sermons. She's like, yeah, whatever, Kate. <sighs> she has nothing to do with the church. She, she watched me go through this a religious awakening, this conversion experience, and it just, she, it's not something that she has chosen to go along with. But... Do I love and care for her, no matter what? Absolutely. Does she do the same for me? Absolutely. Do we hold all of the same beliefs about the world we live in? No. So I know it's possible. Because I'm ornery and stubborn. And so I know if I can have that kind of connection with another human being who does not see the world as the way I do, then I know we can. And I know that God wants us to so that, see that's the important piece, so that we are able to focus on that message of love, healing, and forgiveness instead of you're right and I'm wrong. Amen? No? I know I said it with a question, so you gave it back to me with a question, but I think it's, a, it's an a, amen. Because I believe God can do that even through us. 
So let's walk this journey knowing that God has equipped us to have these hard conversations and love one another still. That God has called us to love the unlovable person so that everyone knows that they are loved by God. Amen? Amen. Our next hymn is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It's number 298 in the Maroon Book. Please stand if able, and we'll be doing Apostles' Creed right after. Please stand if able. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and poor contempt on I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to invite us into a time of prayer with God and with each other, but I've got some joys to share first. We, we did announce uh, last week that Lincoln Martin Krasko was born on Sunday last week. Uh, he, he is the son of Victoria and Chandler Krasko, and grandparents Brenda and Tom are here. And uh, Tom and Karen Krasko. Oh, gosh. They, so Grandpa Tom, is that, that's how it works there in that family, huh? Okay. They're both named Tom. So we give thanks to God for that. And um, Michelle's going to have words for me, not Wilson Smith. Um, it's her birthday. She catches up to me this week. She's just a couple months behind me. She's over in the corner over there, and she's really not going to be happy. So don't look, don't look, don't look. <laughs> but can we sing happy birthday? Sure. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Michelle. Happy birthday to you. So here's the thing, you're so far back there, I know you just made a motion at me, but I can't see you. 
You're just a blurry blob. All right, let's join together in prayer with God and one another. If you have any joy, I want you to lift that up and say, Lord, for your blessings, hear our praise. If you have a concern, Lord, uh, oh, wow, my brain just stopped. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, as we gather as your body here in Eden, New York, in prayer with each other, we give thanks to you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross, making all of this possible. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. God, we lift up the places in our world that are dealing with natural disasters. We think especially of Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, and any other place where those tornadoes have hit. Lord, may we come together to care for those in need. And may those in need receive what is necessary. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. God, we lift up those places in our world that are suffering in war. We think of Ukraine and Assyria. God, we pray for your lasting peace to come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, we lift up the families of the victims from Monday. God, we pray that even in this time they would find peace in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, our prayer. prayer. God, we lift up those among us who are dealing with various illnesses and physical ailments. God, we pray for your hand of healing for each of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God, we do give thanks for the celebrations in life, for anniversaries, for birthdays, mm -hmm. for new life. Lord, for your blessings, hear our, hear our praise. praise. God, we pray that you would continue to work in and through each of us, that we would be able to see each person we encounter in this world as one created by you and as one you have died for. Help us as we grow in our relationship with you that it, be, it may be noticeable to others, that we may be able to share the life of faith with them. We ask all of this through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and pray as he taught us to. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite us to uh, join together in the invitation and the confession of pardon for the book that's missing. For the service of communion. You can find that on the wall or in your hymnal. Page seven. Page seven. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed, failed to, to be an obedient, obedient church. church. We have, we have not, not done your will. will. We have, we have broken your law. law. We, we have, have rebelled, rebelled against, against your love. love. We, have we have not loved, loved our neighbors, neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. needy. Forgive, Forgive us, we pray. Free us, free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. 
So now for the offering. As those who have been forgiven, as those who have been reconciled, let us offer back to God our gifts. For the people at home, you can go to the website and uh, push on the Tithely app, the donor box, or the PayPal button, or scan the QR code, or you can mail it in. Will the ushers please come forward? Please stand. Babel. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Father, please accept these thy gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So I need some assistance with communion. I've got myself and Jim. And uh, Lori, would you mind helping? Yeah. And the other person who just raised her hand because my mind went blank. Yes, I know who you are. Yes. Mm -hmm. You, Paula. There it came. And you're like, how does she remember all that stuff for the sermon, but she can't remember somebody's name? It's a different part of the brain, I swear. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If the two of you would come forward, there is sanitizer there. I did make bread. It came out really dense this week, so let's see how it goes. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give our, our thanks, praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image, breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the, in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, 
gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. One in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, our all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Because there is one loaf, we who are many partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Come forward and receive what you are called to be, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood.
So I know nobody knows the last song. So you got to be prepared for it. It's a chant. It's a hymn. It's actually a monastic chant. And once you get the hang of that, that you understand that it's da 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 you can handle it. I'm sure of it. But Henry will complain afterwards, just so you know. So. <laughs> Please stand if able. It's Sing My Tongue, the Glorious Battle. It's number 296 from the Rune Book, and the words will be on the wall. Sing my tongue the glorious battle, sing the ending of the fray. Now above the cross a trophy, sound the loud triumphant lay. Tell how Christ the world's redeemer as a victim won the day. Tell how when at length the fullness, the appointed time was come, Christ the Word was born of woman, left for us his heavenly home, showed us human life made perfect. Shown as light amid the gloom. Thus, with thirty years accomplished, when he forth from Nazareth, destined, dedicated, willing, wrought his work and met his death. Like a limb, he humbly. dying breath. Faithful cross, our sign of triumph, now for us the noblest tree. None in foliage, none in blossom, none in fruit that fear may be. Symbol of the the weight that hung on thee. Unto God be praise and glory, to the Father and the Son, to the eternal Spirit, honor, now and evermore be done. Praise and glory go forth into our community, into our lives, knowing that God has called us and equipped us to be his hands and feet and words of love so that no one would believe they are of no value. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you are comfortable, take the hands of the person next to you and we shall sing Shalom. Shalom to you. 